I'd like to thank Ambassador Anderson very much for that uh, very uh, challenging keynote speech. And, and we know, we can see through that, the link between the international and the domestic. Any of us, and I see heads nodding around the room from people who are involved in doing stuff on the ground in Northern Ireland, that even talking at the strategic level, we understand that at, at local level. Um, and for uh, drawing uh, our attention to some of the, the excellent work for which Ireland is recognised, not least by Irish Aid and the Defence Forces who are here in force this morning um, in, in their work uh, abroad, and yet challenging us to go further, to be transparent, to look at where we could do more, and to actually either develop the framework or work outside the framework if the framework uh, isn't working. And indeed, just to refer to both the domestic and, and the international examples, we got many international examples of challenges. This issue of women's participation, it's about women as agents of change, as much as being affected as victims of any conflict that is going on. And it's that women's agents of change, which is kind of, I think, Ambassador Anderson is pointing out has actually been underdeveloped in the field. In, in fact, it's one of the good examples uh, that we can export from the lessons of the peace process in Northern Ireland, where women seized the opportunity, even before Resolution 1325, to actually run a women's party. And we have some evidence of the impact of what that did, both on the dynamic and on the content of those negotiations. Now, how far that has been implemented since then, we can talk about. <laughs> but I think, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for, um, for those remarks, which we will, we will discuss uh, later in the day. Uh, it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Liz McManus, who is chair of the monitoring group of Ireland's NAP on UN Resolution 1325. Uh, Liz, and this was new to me, was born in Canada. Uh, I didn't actually realise that. Uh, and she is a founder director of Bray Women's Refuge. You will see this in, in, in your notes. And I would ask you to take some time to read uh, the notes, the background notes of the people who are speaking. Uh, you know uh, she was elected to the Dáil uh, and served there for many years, including uh, as a, a minister of state and as former deputy leader of the Labour Party. Obviously, she had terms on, on town councils and county councils as well. Uh, she's authored a number of policy papers, for example, on climate change law, health care reform and renewable energy. And she headed up the Labour Party campaign on the abortion referendum in 1998. Uh, again, something that I knew, uh, that I discovered in talking to Liz uh, just recently in relation to the review of the Irish National Action Plan, um, was that she is a writer and uh, has uh, been awarded the Hennessy New Irish Writing Award, the Le Stoll Short Story Award, and the Irish Pen Award. And her first novel, Acts of, Subver of Subversion, was shortlisted by, by an Irish Times Aer Lingus First Novel Award. So we're going to see more, and hopefully about women in print. Liz. Thank you very much indeed, Brona. Um, first of all, can I, can I thank Melanie and Ronan and the team for uh, putting forward this uh, conference uh, and this program. Uh, I think by the end of the day, we're all, I can certainly speak for myself, we're all going to be a lot wiser. Um, and uh, if we're not, it won't be for want of their trying. Uh, as you're aware, the, the uh, National Action Plan uh, that Ireland uh, produced was actually launched in November 2011. And it makes very specific provision for the monitoring and evaluation of its implementation. I have to say, I was very impressed with the NAP, uh, the way it was structured, the fact that there were smart indicators used, that there was very little wriggle room. Uh, and I think that is extremely helpful in the work that we now have as a monitoring group. Uh, overseeing the implementation of the NAP. But firstly, I would like to pay tribute to uh, the work and the memory of Inez McCormack, who played such a vital leadership role in this whole area. I think when we're looking at any plan or strategy, we're we have to be conscious of the fact that there are many strategies and plans mouldering on shelves all over government departments and outside and that this NAP 
must not add to that particular pile. I think our job as monitoring committee and monitoring group is simply to ensure the effective uh, action in relation to the requirements of the NAP. And I think one of the interesting points about it is that it's described as a living document, that that is implicit in the, in the NAP itself, that is seen as an ongoing dynamic process rather than an end in itself. And part of our job as a group is to, is to see how it can be improved, the lessons learned, uh, what can be identified for the future. So our job is, the mechanism is there for the group to identify uh, challenges, modifications for the next NAP. But it also provides uh, an arena, a forum, whereby we can enable the agencies, the statutory bodies, to report on an ongoing basis uh, in relation to uh, work that has been done to implement the NAP. It is a, a, a group that is finely balanced between statutory organisations, statutory departments and agencies, civil society groups and academics, and I think that is one of its great strengths. Within NAP, there is also a provision for us to produce two reports, an interim report after 18 months uh, and a final report after three years. And these reports are to be done by consultants employed to focus on the work that um, is required by the NAP. And I think, it, again, it reinforces the idea that it's an ongoing process uh, and that we want to ensure at the end of it we can see, uh, indeed, as Anne has pointed out, the, the lacuna, the, um, the issues that arise as we move on and how we can ensure that the next NAP is, is meeting the needs of, of the days that are coming. At the end of last year, I was appointed chair of the monitoring group. I was proposed by the civil society groups and um, uh, appointed by the minister. I'm an independent chair, but I'm new to this. Uh, and maybe that's not a bad thing. I don't know, but it's certainly uh, been a, a steep learning curve in terms of seeing the importance and the range and extent of what we are talking about, because it truly is global and local all at once. Uh, and that, I think, um, makes for, for certainly interesting as well as valuable work. As I said, the group consists of equal representation from both government departments, agencies with responsibilities under the NAP, and civil society representatives and academics with expertise relevant to 1325. And it is receiving very good, solid report, uh, support from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and I'd like to acknowledge that uh, today because it has been a very good working relationship. But this idea of a living document is absolutely central to what we are doing. And we have begun, even though we're not that long in existence, we have begun to look at um, the implementation of the NAP and identifying challenges in certain areas which require further investigation, but it's very early days. Uh, there is a provision for dialogue and reporting uh, from the government departments and the agencies and a dialogue between them and the, the civil society and the academics. So I'm hopeful that we have a kind of a constructive relationship that can develop over the years ahead. In the autumn of this year, we're planning a thematic uh, conference on some aspect of 1325, uh, and already a subcommittee of the group has been established to, to work on that particular uh, project. This May will mark 18 months of the existence of the, are they, I hope they're not attacking us, are they? The tanks are coming in. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> as long as it's equal men and women doing it. <laughs> um, one of the, the strengths that we have is in relation to the, re the reviews. The first one has to be completed within 18 months, uh, and we appointed consultants. Um, we didn't give them much time, I'm afraid, because the time frame was fairly tight. But I was very pleased 
that the application was selected was a dual application from uh, Brona Hines and Karen McMinn, who are both here with us today. And I must say, having been <coughs> interrogated by them for two and a half hours, I can say to you that they are working extremely hard within a, a very limited time frame to deliver the goods on a report. But more importantly than anything else, they're bringing to their work a passion, which I think is enormously important in terms of the kind of report that is going to come to us. And obviously, the, the group will be involved at the final drafting stage. Uh, we will hope to have, we intend to have the report out uh, by the end of May, or certainly agreed by the end of May, and go for publication. And it will be published uh, as a hard copy report. So we have the framework in the NAP uh, for the monitoring of the implementation. The, com the monitoring group is up and running. Um, I'm very conscious, and I want to express my appreciation of the goodwill that has been already expressed by the members, some of whom are here, who uh, uh, are and will be attending meetings into the future. The NAP itself has a clarity and precision, which is uh, very important and very helpful to the work that we have to um, uh, do. The fact that there is a recognition within the NAP of its changing nature is very helpful as well, because it means that there is even a participation by the group in terms of the expertise that we're all bringing from our different um, areas. And the two progress reports, the one now and the one at the end of the, the three years, uh, are going to feed in to the next um, production of the NAP, uh, new NAP. It's very early to say uh, the vision, you know, what, what is going to emerge, because this is a, a collective activity that we're embarked on, and it's also something that we have to build when we have the material and the information that has been garnered by Brona and Karen. But a couple of things I would say that are kind of signaling themselves. Um, one is issues around the work of departments and agencies, but also the work between departments. Uh, historically, and certainly been my experience when I was minister, I was aware of the kind of, you know, the old silo uh, mentality that exists uh, in government departments. Uh, and the lack of coordination that has built up historically. I think that's something that we need to uh, consider and, and look at more closely. The second point is relationship building between the statutory, the civil, or the statutory bodies and the civil society organizations. Um, because that is, and I'm very struck by um, the, the point being made that actually the impetus and the drive for 1325 came from the civil society uh, organisations. And I think that is a point that we need to, to in, you know, examine and to be conscious of in our work. The third point that may create some difficulties for us is the response of outside bodies. Because in the NAP, there are references to various bodies like you know, the Oireachtas Committees or the OSCE. And really, it's not within our gift as a monitoring group to have any direct say over how they do their business. Um, I've uh, written to the Foreign Affairs Committee chairman and I've received a positive response, but I don't know how far, uh, in relation to the Iraq this committee, but I don't know how far we can take that kind of uh, connections and how much we can build on them. I think in relation to Northern Ireland, wherever we find that discussion, we have to find it because the, there is a living example on our doorstep of what happens uh, where there is conflict, where there is peace building, and what happens to the women in those two experiences. Uh, and uh, I think you know, today's event is going to highlight that, um, in, in part at least, and I think that's going to be very valuable because it's something we, we have to consider. And I suppose the last point is echoing really uh, what has been said already is relation to implementation. That you can have implementation on paper and everybody can go home satisfied, 
But that doesn't necessarily mean that there has been any fundamental change whatsoever. And I think, you know, when you look at our monitoring group, there's an awful lot of experience built up. Uh, people who've had probably scars to show it as well when it comes to learning how political processes work, how um, departmental process, whatever it may be. That kind of experience, I think, has to ensure that when we talk about implementation, we're talking about implementation and not just talking about talking about implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you.